So let's get started. Uh, we're going to, uh, today's lesson and tomorrow's lesson, if we finish it, um, this is adapted from actually one of the uh, things you can analyze. Uh, Robert Sargent has a, a soul winning class called Personal Evangelism. It's a, a booklet. It's a very good booklet. There's other ones that are out there, but uh, I'm adapting a lesson he has um, in his and then um, I actually have developed an, another section, so we're going we're gonna to work on that. So the, the first thing is 10 reasons to engage in personal evangelism. 10 reasons to engage in personal evangelism. All right, I'm going to do them by letters, okay? Um, so I'll say uh, the letter. Okay, so uh, number one, or letter A, the first reason to engage in personal evangelism because it is given to us in the Great Commission. I'll give you the passages, Matthew 28, 18 through 20, Matthew 28, 18 through 20, Mark 16, 15, Luke 24, 46 through 48, and John 20, 21. Matthew 28, Mark 16, Luke 24, and John 20. And then we also have Acts 1, 8, and that's, uh, ye shall be witness unto me both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. So we, we have it listed to us. Uh, there are some people that get offended. In fact, I know a pastor that a family left his church because he used the term the Great Commission. Um, I kind of find it there uh, in the Bible. So if you don't like the term commission, uh, then it's a great command, I guess, or a great go get them uh, something. But it, it is kind of a challenge to us. It's a command to us that we should be out there reaching people with the gospel. God has left it upon us. There's there's all kinds of debate. There's, there's people that say, well, um, can... Uh, can there be other ways to uh, spread the gospel? There may be. I, I don't know. Maybe there's some alien out there. Um, people really get into that. Um, aliens and uh, UFOs. And so maybe there's something out there that would, uh, uh, you know, transfer some message, uh, message through your mind. But I, I don't think so. I haven't met anybody that got saved that way. God has left it upon us as human beings to carry forth the message of, of Christ. And so that is a command. It's, it's on us. And we, we can, and, and by, by saying there's a debate in, in theological circles, sometimes there's a debate on, um, you know, whether it's Calvinism, Arminianism, you have all that type of stuff that you get into when it comes to salvation. But what we know is that God has in Scripture, and it's very clearly laid out, that we have to go out there and be active in the area of witnessing. You can't deny this in these passages in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then also in the book of Acts. So we're going to give you a couple points underneath this and that it's given in the Great Commission. First of all, the commission was given to the disciples corporately. Now, what, it, what does that mean? All right, there was 11 disciples at the time, and then remember just shortly after that in Acts 1, they added another one. But the individual apostles were unable to fully execute the commission in their lifetime. So it's given to them corporately, so it's handed down to us. Right? We would understand that. It would only make sense. So the disciples get it, but it does, does it mean that only the disciples got the commission? By corporately, what we're saying, it was given to them to hand down uh, through the ages. Right? Fulfilling it is well beyond the scope of and ability of any individual so corporately. So that means as a church we're doing it, and then individuals make up the idea of working on this, but then different churches. All right, so that's where um, not, not every, um, let's say in the area of missions, we're, we're responsible to reach the world, all right, but every church cannot reach the whole world. I mean, it, it only makes sense. So corporately, as churches then, as individuals, we're working together to 
uh, cover the world. That's what we're trying to do. Uh, fulfilling it is well beyond the scope and ability of any individual. All right, and for instance, uh, we know there's well over 7 billion people living in well over, they, they believe it's over 200 nations. So it's hard. How are we going to cover 7 billion people when it's a very small percentage? Well, it's given to all of Christian, all of Christianity, corporately, all right? Uh, preaching the gospel to every soul, then baptizing and discipling all who believe. Um, like doing it, doing it for one person. I cannot, I cannot preach, baptize, and disciple the whole world. Okay, neither can you. So it's a corporate, uh, it's a corporal, uh, corporate uh, commission. The commission was. Uh, gives us authority also to win souls. All right? It gives us the authority to win souls. What do we mean by that? Christ's command to his churches gives them and the individual soul winner divine authority to witness and testify of Christ. Some people do not like that. Okay? There's a, there's a strong movement almost against soul winning and witnessing. But here in these passages, it gives us the authority from who? From Christ. So when we're going out, that helps us. It helps us because having authority is very important. Even when you, uh, let's say that you are, um, probably not the guys, hopefully, it's a little, maybe, maybe some of you, but a little creepy if you're a um, guy, you're a babysitter, but let's take a babysitting situation. Um, and so here you're babysitting, the parents leave, and, what, and they say to their kids, hey, just so you know, the babysitter's here. If they tell you anything, do not obey them. <laughs> All right? Well, why would you watch them? Why would you watch the kids? Or chain them up, like we saw recently <laughs> or, um, uh, in the news. Do something. Why? Because, you know, I'll, I don't have any authority then. Well, Christ, when he tells us to do something, he also gives us the authority to do it. All right, so soul winning, uh, the authority has been handed down to us from Christ. We speak for and in the place of Christ. Remember Paul, uh, a passage is, is found in 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 5. He says, we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. So we're not speaking about ourselves. We're not preaching our doctrine. We're not trying to convince people of our words. We're trying to preach about Christ and the Savior. Okay? Um, all right, so let's go to point two. All right, so uh, point two. So number one was it's given in the Great Commission. All right, our letter A, letter uh, B, or point two, it is obedience to the great commandment. What do we mean by the great commandment? We're not talking about the great commission here. We're talking about the great commandment. So what's the great commandment? That's found in Matthew 22. Matthew 22, 37 and 38. And here somebody asked him, Master, which is the great commandment? which is the great commandment in the law. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. Okay, love for God. First of all, love for God is expressed through obedience. How do we know that? John 14. If you love me, you're going to keep my commandments. John 14, that's verse 15 and verse 21. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. Luke 6, 46, and why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? So, obedience to the great commandment. Okay, If we love the Lord, we're going to obey what he says. Why? Because I, the great commandment is loving the Lord with all my heart, all my soul, all my strength, all my mind. And loving him means that what am I going to do? We're carrying it out. That means I obey what he tells me to do. So did Christ tell us 
to seek souls. Well, he did. Matthew 4 and verse 19. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Acts 10, 42. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and the dead. So, if love for God is expressed through obedience, then I must obey those things which he tells me to do, and God commands us to be seeking souls for him. Okay, John 20, 21, Jesus said to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. James 4, 17, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. So what is the Bible instructing us? The Bible is telling us that if I love God, I will keep his commandments. And one of the things that we must do is love God. Why? Because that's the greatest commandment. I'm going to love him with all my heart. So it, it kind of, it's, it's reciprocal there. So I must love God. Loving God means I obey him. All right, by obeying him, that means I love him. So I find out the things that God wants me to do. One of the things that is clear in the scripture is that we must be witnessing, we must be a winner of souls. So that's number two. All right, number three, our letter C. It is also the fulfilling of the royal law. The royal law is mentioned in, the, in James. Okay? In James chapter 2, it's part of the discussion of the great, uh, of the great commandment. Remember, we were there in uh, Matthew 22. Matthew 22 and verse 38, because here someone comes and says, Master, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus gives them the great commandment. And what is the great commandment? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. We know that. So then in James, it redefines the second commandment, which is like unto it. Remember, Jesus said that in verse 39. He said, in, um, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. That's in verse 39 of that passage in Matthew 22. But in James chapter 2, James gives another definition to this second commandment. It's known as the royal law. What is the royal law? If you fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. All right, so it's a fulfillment of the royal law. So let's uh, consider a couple points under this idea of the royal law. Soul winning is an act of love. It is one of the greatest expressions of love and concern for our fellow man. Why would we say that? Why is that one of the greatest expressions of, of love? All right, because what are we doing? All right, we're, we have the capability of not just affecting them here on this earth, it's for eternity. All right, there's a lot of things that we can do. All right, and, and the Bible, that passage in James, is kind of directing it more towards uh, things here. It's not really dealing with the eternal. In James chapter 2, that's dealing with us that tell someone, hey, um, you know, I'm glad, I'm glad you came to our services. Be warmed and filled. Remember, that's the whole idea. And then they walk out, and they ain't warmed and filled. They're starving and they're freezing. Okay. Well, the, the Bible there is talking about things that we should do to help them. There's a relationship that we can lead people towards Christ by sometimes taking care of the physical necessities that they have. And when all we're and when we come up to them and say, Hey, brother, I just care about your soul, and we never show any concern about some of their physical needs, the things that they're lacking, it's telling us in the book of James, you know, I question your love. I question your faith. So uh, we understand that there are some things that we need to be doing. That's why there's missions. That's why uh, there's food pantries. That's why you do some of those things. All right, but if that's all we do, 
If all we do is just take care of some temporal things, if all we do is uh, give them a bowl of soup, all right, is, is thinking of that, you know, in the, the many years ago you'd have the soup lines. If all, the, all we do is give them a, a bowl of soup and we give them a place to bunk and we never, we never really try to affect their eternal destiny, then I'm really not caring for them. Yes, it's a little bit of an act of love, but it's not to the extent that here we have the capability or the ability of giving them the gospel and it doesn't just affect in the next 10 years. It affects eternity. All right, that's why soul winning is an act of love. It is one of the greatest expressions of love. Why? Because the concern for your fellow man is not just in the next year or 10 years. It's an eternal caring because we can, we can change their eternal destiny. True compassion is expressed when we are moved towards the lost. That is found in Mark 6.34. And Jesus, when he came out, saw much people and was moved with compassion towards them because they were as sheep not having a shepherd. So in Mark 6, true compassion is not just caring about somebody's physical need. We should care about that if we're biblical because that's uh, explained to us that that is one of the expressions of God's love. But if that's all we do, then we truly do not care for them. Because Jesus was moved not just because they were hungry. He was moved because he saw sheep that had no shepherd. What did that mean? It meant that they were lost. That's what, right, do you guys get that? Sheep without a shepherd are not found. Okay, they are lost sheep. That's an expression of salvation there. Uh, Jude 22 and 23 and, and of some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. James 5, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. Psalm 142, verse 4, I looked on my right hand and beheld, but there was no man that would know me, refuge fell me, no man cared for my soul. So soul winning is an act of love. All right, it is, um, it is an expression of compassion. And a lack of compassion is unacceptable to God. Where do we find that? Uh, Proverbs 24. I'll, I'll just read. I'm going to list out a couple but then um, so that you can put them down. But then I will read a couple of them. Proverbs 24. 11 and 12. An illustration is 2 uh, Kings 7. 2 Kings 7. And Ezekiel 3. I think most know the Ezekiel 3. But let me read you Proverbs 24. If thou forbear to deliver them that are drawn unto death and those that are ready to be slain, if thou sayest, Behold, we knew it not, doth not he that pondereth the heart considereth Consider it, and he that keepeth thy soul doth not he know it, and shall not he render to every man according to his works. So it's telling us to consider. If we have the capability of delivering somebody and we don't, it's saying that there's going to be an accountability. We are going to be accountable. Also, uh, Ezekiel chapter 3, I mentioned this, verse son of man, verse 17, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore, hear the word of my mouth. Give them warning from me. When I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life. The same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. And if thou warn the wicked, and he turn away, and turn not away from his wicked, wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. So there's a responsibility on us. What's our responsibility? To share the gospel with people. Now again, there's a, there could be an overbalance 
I've talked to our staff about this, and I think in, in certain realms, there's an overbalance of this burden. All right, remember, what is the Great Commission given? It's given to us corporately. So is it my job to win the whole world? I can't do that. All right, but it still is my job to be praying and to then do what I can do. Now, how will I know if I'm doing that? I'm having a right relationship with God. That means daily I'm in his word, daily I'm trying to um, have a relationship with God, I'm trying to make sure that he is dealing with me, I am sensitive to the Holy Spirit and his leading so that when I'm out and about, he can, he can, uh, the Holy Spirit can nudge me and say, hey, why don't you talk to this person? Why don't you leave a track? Why don't you write this person? Why don't you... Uh, there's different things that we can do in order to be a testimony, in order to share Christ. And so I need to make sure that my conscience is clear. So corporately, though, I can't reach the whole world. So is this saying that, you know what, there is somebody that um, lives in uh, Ireland or somebody that lives uh, down in Brazil? I never gave him the gospel. I didn't. I don't know how I can do that. Okay, so does it mean that you know, when, I, when I die and get to heaven, there's going to be this whole list of the whole world? All right, and so six, six something billion people, because maybe I was able to reach, I was able to talk to 900 people. All right, there's seven billion people, so you, figure, you do the math. All right, I'm way off. All right, there's a long list of people that I never reached with the gospel. So there can be an over. Uh, an overbalance on this burden thing. And some people get that, so they're almost always in depression. Right? That's not how we're supposed to live. I can be right with God, be doing everything I can, and everybody in the world is not going to be saved. Do we understand that? Some of that is because I am sharing the gospel with who I can share the gospel with. All right, so there's a, there's a, there's a uh, balance that we must have when we're studying this. Everybody in the world is not your responsibility. But there are people that are your responsibility, and that's what you need to be saying, God, lead me to those people. So you're involved in certain ministries. You should be praying. The weight of that should be on your shoulders, and you're praying for them. You're trying to look for opportunities to share Christ with them. Why? Because when you get to heaven, I believe, you're going to answer. You're not going to answer for another ministry. No, you weren't in that ministry, but the ministry you're in, are you sharing Christ with them? Are you uh, trying to work at presenting Christ in the right fashion? All right, so there's a, there's a, a, a responsibility, and the Old Testament gives us an, uh, an illustration in Proverbs 24 and 2 Kings 7, and then it gives us a warning in Ezekiel chapter 3 that God has made us watchmen, and if we know of coming judgment, our job is to warn people of that coming judgment. All right, this love of Christ is a constraining love. All right, if the royal law, thou shalt love thy neighbor, as thyself, it's gonna it's gonna help us to be to be vigilant in this area. For the love of Christ constraineth or compels us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. Uh, uh, yeah, then we're all dead. That's Second Corinthians five fourteen. So we're on number number four. Number four. All right, so let's try to keep moving here. Our number four, letter D. So the last one, it's the fulfilling of the royal law. Number four, our letter D, it is expected of every church member. All right, let me give you some passages. Um, in Acts chapter 8, Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. 
the Bible tells us, and Saul was consenting unto his death, and at that time there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. All right, so we see that there's uh, a persecution, and only the apostles remained. Everybody else was scattered abroad. What did this scattering abroad do? Verse 4, therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere, guess what they were doing? Preaching the word. All right, that idea of preaching the word also is the idea of testifying it. Sometimes the word preaching, especially in the book of Acts, sometimes in uh, the Great Commission, it's not necessarily somebody getting up behind a pulpit. It is the idea of proclaiming Christ. It's witnessing. So um, here was the church members, and persecution came in. And the persecution, what did it do? It scattered them abroad, but it didn't relinquish them from their responsibility to do what? Share Christ. One of the reasons that persecution came in was to spread the gospel. Sometimes, sometimes we need to look at that. If we believe in the providence of God and we believe in his leading, sometimes God brings something into your life to get you in a different direction to consider maybe another set of people that have not been reached. God does that. Why? Because he wants everybody to be reached with the gospel. All right? It's expected of every church member. Uh, in Acts chapter 11, we see the fruit of, of their reaching out in Acts 11 and verse 19. Now, they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phoenice and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but uh, unto the Jews only. Some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene. Uh, and, the, and verse 21, and the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. So what was some of the result of this persecution? A lot of people got saved. Sometimes we look at trials or we look at something that is hard, that maybe it's going gonna, it's gonna to ruin the ministry, it's going to shut things down. And what's amazing, sometimes when you, when you follow the hand of God, God is using it. To bring more people to him okay so it so in in the book of acts we see that the average church member what were they involved in soul winning the average church member was involved in soul winning so some people say well wait a minute what about the pastor so what is the duty of a pastor the bible gives us an explanation in ephesians chapter 4 in ephesians 4 What's, what's some of the duty of a pastor? And he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. What were they given for? To soul win. No. It says, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. That word perfecting means mature or complete. So, Pastors are given to help complete or mature believers for the work of the ministry. You'd say, oh, that doesn't, that's, I'm out. All right, that word ministry is the same word. That word ministry is the same Greek word that we get the word deacon from. Which, what does deacon mean? Anybody know? Just means simply serve. So, if you take that and put it into this, to, um, for the maturing of the saints, for the work of serving. All right, so the pastor has come in to help build up his people so that they can go out till we all come into the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, um, then in verse 15, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him and all things which is the head, even Christ. Um, so the, the Bible is indicating to us that pastors are given to help build 
his, the members of the church so that they are equipped to go out and to serve. And what is part of the service? Loving people in the areas that they're ministering to bring them to Christ. Okay, so it's expected of church members and then churches are given people and leadership to help them grow so that they then are equipped to go out and be soul winners. Okay, so that's number four. Number five, we're, 10 reasons why we should be involved in personal evangelism. Number five, or letter E, it is a partnership with God. Partnership. Where do we see that? 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 9. 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 9. The Bible tells us in that passage, for we are laborers together with God. Laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. So we are laborers. Soul winner and the Spirit of God have a part to play in bringing a sinner to God. So what is our part? Our part, Romans 10, 14, how shall they hear without a preacher? And again, remember that passage there, that idea of preaching means testifying. It's not a necessarily behind a pulpit. Acts 8, 31, and, and he, the Ethiopian, said, How can I, except some man should guide me? The Ethiopian was saying, I've got to have somebody to explain the words of God to me. That is our job as Christians. So our part is being the spokesman, the mouth that God can use to testify of Christ. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 7 through 9. Wherefore, I was made a minister according to the gift of grace of God, given unto me by the effectual working of his power unto me, who am less than the least of all saints. All right, and this is, so he was made a minister later in the passage, he says, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. So he says, I was made a minister, why? To make people see Christ. That's our job. Our part is being a spokesman. What is God's part? John 16, 7 and 8. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. So my job is to be a spokesman. I'm the mouthpiece to go out, but I'm speaking God's word and the Holy Spirit, his part is going before, and guess what he's doing? He's convicting. All right, he's convicting. So there are some people, and that's why I can't take any credit for somebody that gets saved. I can't, I can't take the credit and say, oh, I'm so good. All right, because I'm a spokesman. I'm, I'm just a mouthpiece for him. The Holy Spirit is already doing some work. He's doing that work. All right, so it's expected uh, of every church member. It is a partnership with God, number six. Um, this word, all right, it is a real word. It is the fulfillment of an ambassage, all right, or an ambassador. An ambassage um, is, I guess, the verb form. 2 Corinthians 5.20 Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. So what is an ambassador? He's a representative of what? Another country and his government. So what are we? We are an ambassador for where? Heaven. It's not hard for us to understand. Why? Because are we citizens there? Yes, we are. All right, we, we, sing, we sing the song, This World's Not My Home. All right, the idea behind that is from Scripture. Because we are not now of this earth. We've been, um, the, the Bible says we're what? Joint heirs with Christ. 
without you know getting down a, a long theological discussion. But and, and it is it, it is kind of amazing that we could be, in essence, God's son or daughter. That's what we are. So we're an ambassador. That means we have a heavenly heritage now. We have a heavenly home. And so God has left us here as ambassadors. We don't, we're not, you know, when somebody is an ambassador somewhere else, that's not their home. That's not their home. Where's their home? It's back in the States somewhere. They're a representative of, uh, if it's an American ambassador, they're a representative of America and America's government. So we are a representative here of a heavenly country. All right, a heavenly kingdom. And so we need to represent heaven properly. We need to be speaking about our, our government. And, and some of it, you know, many of us, I've read up some. I remember doing some reading because I was thinking of this concept. This was years ago, and I was either teaching it or preaching it uh, in some aspect of soul winning. And I remember looking up and, and trying to figure out, you know, most of us are like, oh, so what does an ambassador do? Right, there, are many, there are many different roles, and I can't remember them all, and I'm not, uh, we got other points to cover. But that could be just a, a little challenge for you. Look up, what does an ambassador do? What does an ambassador do? Then how does that relate to me? Because that word is there to help us to picture or understand what some of our roles should be here on this earth. They, there is an, an important role, all right, because... Um, they are, are an ambassador in, a, in another country as a representative, and he's watching out for what? America's interest. That's what we have to understand. So I am here on this earth to watch out for heavenly interest and my heavenly uh, uh, government and heavenly kingdom. And that means some of it is to, um, to defend my heaven. All right, I'm supposed to proclaim about my heaven. That's what our job is. Our heavenly country and Lord and King. Okay, so that's number six. Number seven. All right, there's another big word. Um, so it is the fulfillment of an ambassador or an ambassage. Um, number seven, or letter G, it is part of the panoply of armor. You know, we sing that song, the panoply of God. All right, that means armament. All right, remember in Ephesians 6, what does the, in Ephesians 6, we, we go from head to toe. What are the feet shod with? The preparation of the gospel of peace. The preaching of the gospel is part of our armor. And uh, somehow, that are, what, what is one of the things that an armor does for you? Protects you, right? So the, the feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. That means that sharing Christ is part of the armor that I have to help against the fiery darts of the devil. I, and, I, and I've met many pastors, talk with many pastors, and, and Sergeant is in the same category here, because this is what he says. He says, I have rarely met a Christian who earnestly seeks to bring sinners to Christ that is defeated. It is true. It is a rare Christian that is earnestly, and I'm not saying, there are other things, all right? I, am I saying that soul winning without holiness? I am not saying that. But what I'm saying is that it is part of the armor. You can't deny that. Yes, I have the shield, uh, I have the shield of faith and I have the sword of the spirit. Those are there, and I have a helmet of salvation. I have uh, my loins girt about with truth. All of those things are very important, but part of the armor is the gospel of peace. And it's the preparation of the gospel of peace. So one of the things that helps us against the enemy, and it's interesting that it is your feet. To me, that's interesting. Why? Because feet normally um, aren't stationary. 
Feet normally aren't stationary. They're involved in movement. And so what on our body, on our person, in our armor is associated with movement? All right, yes, the shield of faith, I understand it, and a sword. Normally, that's not sitting on your side. All right, but it's not like your helmet. All right, normally, you don't want that movement. Take it off, all kinds of different, all right? But your feet specifically are active and, you know, moving you forward. And what is that associated with? The, the gospel or the preparation of the gospel of peace. It's just interesting to me that in our armament, the gospel is mentioned as one of the things that is there. Okay, it helps us. Um, I, I'm not going to say that there are some people that um, there used to be an idea that if you, uh, win, you know, you win a soul and that covers your sin. I'm not, I am not a proponent of that. But what's interesting is that this is part of, though, the panoply or the armor of God. So here in the armor and specifically our feet, it is the gospel. So we'll stop there with number seven. All right, it is part of the armor or panoply of God. And tomorrow we will finish that up and then try to uh, list out some excuses. All right, some excuses that uh, kind of come to mind and how to resolve those.